There's two ways that I have played Monopoly over the years. There's the way I've played Monopoly with my kids, where uh, we uh, play, but we're nice to each other and make deals. And, you know, the, the goal is to have fun together and also try to win, but um, not destroy each other. But then there's what I call cutthroat monopoly. And when we were in our 20s, we used to have game nights with our friends. And so that would be something that we decided ahead of time. Are we going to play cutthroat or are we going to be nice? And uh, so oftentimes we'd choose cutthroat. And there was no mercy. The goal was to win the game. And usually it did not end up as fun as other games. In the same manner, there's two ways to live your life. In earthly wisdom or heavenly wisdom. One way, he who dies with the most toys wins. In another way, the more we give to God and invest in the things of heaven, the greater the reward. And so as we're pondering life on this earth, as we live as Christians, as well as a church together, as a church family, um, James is teaching the church how to live according to wisdom. And when we do, there is fruit and a lot of amazing things that happen in the church. But when we choose to live in accordance with the world, the church becomes corrupt. And so today we want to be challenged with this great idea of what is heavenly wisdom. And so in verse 13, point one, searching for true wisdom. James begins in verse 13 by asking, who is wise and understanding among you? It's time to take a moment and ponder. What have we admired and called wisdom. This word wise in the biblical language means expert or skilled. In classical Greek, it primarily means to have a mastery and a skill, handicraft or art. Now, it's not often the thing we think about when we think wisdom. We often think of it being intellectually heavy. But the real word for wisdom is heavy on the practical side of things. It's being skilled at life. Being skilled at life, that the way that you live. In the Old Testament, this word was used to describe Bezalel, you know, everybody's favorite Old Testament Bible character. <laughs> he was actually the chief artist in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, the candlestick and all the artistry done on the, the curtains inside the tabernacle and so on. He was called wise or skillful in his artwork and that was used by God to glorify himself in the temple. As we think of wisdom, we are skillful, artful, um, great at living the Christian life, if you will. Paul uses it in the same way in 1 Corinthians 3.10. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. As someone else is building upon it, let each one take care how he builds upon it. He's talking about sharing the gospel and planting a church and how that was done with skillfulness or with wisdom. And then as each person begins to use their gifts and participate in the church body, take care, which the implication is do it skillfully, do it wisely. And so, again, as Christians, we should not be the experts on the theoretical, but on the practical the skill of living a godly life. And the second word we see tied to wisdom is understanding. 
we get our word epistemology from this word, which is the study of knowing or knowledge. Um, in classical greed, it's used often like wisdom, but it includes the idea of being learned scien or scientifically versed. This is what we oftentimes think primarily as wisdom. In English, in our language, we might use the word scientist to describe what it means to be a person of understanding. And so wisdom focuses on the practical living, understanding on a special training or an intelligent application of that knowledge. And so... Just like in our world today, there are a lot of intelligent people who run large corporations, who are very good at what they do, but when it comes down to their own lives, they can't manage their own life. They cannot live in a way that is wise. And so, understanding is only part of the picture. Wisdom is what's put forth as that great aspect that we're looking at today. God desires us to be skilled and trained in the knowledge of Scripture and other disciplines, but living skillfully in the practical matters of the Christian life is of greater value. And so I'm going to look at some passages that talk about where does this wisdom come from? In Proverbs 2.6 it says, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom is not going to be found in necessarily the many volumes that have been written throughout the centuries, but rather from the mouth of God as he personally speaks to you. At the same time, wisdom comes from God it leads to what I call the paradox of wisdom, which is described in Proverbs 26, 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. The paradox of wisdom is that those who are truly wise know they are not wise. We realize our wisdom comes from another place, and that is God. God's wisdom is beyond anything that you can imagine. In Isaiah 55, 9, it says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so it is a good thing that we find our wisdom from God because we can't even imagine. We can't think well enough to come up with true wisdom. It has to be delivered to us. So if you want to begin this journey of wisdom, it begins with this. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And so if you want to begin this journey, what the fear of the Lord is, is you care about what he thinks more than what man thinks. The fear of man and the fear of the Lord are in constant tension in our lives. They're the opposites, if you will. And so when we fear God, we don't fear man. We don't care what man thinks. And so we have to set aside our pride and humble ourselves before a great God that is way too awesome for us to comprehend and to no longer live in the fear of man. And so James begins and he says, in answer to who is wise and understanding. So let's answer that question. It says, you know that person by his or her good conduct. Let him show it, show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Two qualities of the wise person, two things that make them stand out so that you can recognize them. The first is good conduct. Wisdom is seen by good conduct. It's behavioral, not intellectual. And so actions speak louder than words. We've 
We know that phrase. Um, but do we, when it comes to the Christian life, actually live accordingly? Good conduct is not seen in talk as much as action in the walk. So, the second thing. Wisdom is seen in meekness. Or deeds done in humility, as some other translations say. Meekness or humility. This word meekness means gentleness, humility, although it's more commonly rendered meekness. Um, I don't think this word is something that's very popular in our day and age. If somebody called you meek, you'd be like, oh yeah? <laughs> Let me show you. I'm not meek. Because we think of meek as being weak. They rhyme. But they're not the same thing. Meekness is not passive gentleness that comes from weakness or fear. Meekness is actually a, a word that's used to describe in the ancient language a powerful horse that has a bit and bridle and is trained so that that power is focused on a purpose instead of recklessness. So meekness, it's a picture of strength under control. So men, this is, should be something that we think of as being a manly thing. Um, strength under control. Jesus promises the meek this in Matthew 5.5. 5, Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. That's not what we are used to hearing. The thing that we're used to hearing or thinking is that blessed are those who take things by force because it'll be theirs in the end. But rather, blessed are those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit and use their strength in accordance with His will and purposes because in the end, you will inherit everything. Pretty cool. An excellent example of meekness, just to take it a step further, into a personal example for us, somebody who lived it out before us in a way such that God said this man was the meekest person on the face of the earth. His name is Moses. In Numbers 12, 1 through 13, we see this amazing example of meekness. It's seen in relation to the way his brother and sister treated him. So let's check this out. Miriam and Aaron, Moses' brother and sister, spoke out against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. So a little bit of racism there. Uh, Cush, Cush is the heir of Ethiopia. Um, and they said... Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? So now a little entitlement or pride creeping in. Hey, our little brother Moses isn't the only one that can do something great around here. Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Oops. He hears everything, by the way. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam. This is like when dad comes home after brothers and sisters are arguing and uh, it's time to go face the music. Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance to the tent and called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forward, and he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. So Moses has this amazing intimacy with God. And God chose to do this with Moses. Moses didn't attain this by his own power or goodness. 
Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. So the cloud lifts up. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. It's like a horror show. And he's freaking out. And Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, Oh, God, please heal her, please. Now, if that was me, I'd be like, Hey, God, you know, just let it hang around for a week or so. And... <laughs> Till she's really sorry for what she did. But that's not Moses. Moses intercedes. Oh God, please heal her. Please. That is a meek person. Setting aside his own rights, his own concerns and reputation because he cared about his sister even though she was mean to him. And so instead of condemning her, he prayed for her. Moses was not a man out of control. He was a man under the influence of the very heart of God. And so it showed in the way that he treated his siblings. So meekness and good behavior. But to contrast that, again, James' question was, who is wise and understanding among you? In verses 4 through 16, he shows us who is not wise. So he paints a picture of the unwise person and says, it's not them. And so let's take a look at that. It says in verse 14, point number two, characteristics of demonic wisdom. That may sound harsh, but bear with me. It's right there in the text. Characteristics of demonic wisdom. Um, but if you have bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast and be false to the truth. And so we see that the word wisdom could be used to describe wisdom from heaven, which is the true wisdom, but also demonic wisdom, which would be wisdom from below. Totally separate um, skill sets, if you will. And so James helps us distinguish between the two. Demonic wisdom has unmistakable characteristics, and here they are. Number one, bitter jealousy, which speaks of a resentment against someone. Bitter jealousy is recognized when we can't stand the success of another person. When we see it or hear about it or we see a post on Facebook and it appears they're being blessed and we just go, oh, it has a bitter taste to it. We're enraged when someone else experiences the limelight, casts a shadow on us. That was actually the characteristic of the religious leaders when Christ was on the earth and they wanted to kill him. And after Christ ascended, when the apostles were doing amazing works as they were preaching about the kingdom of God and the gospel, it says in Acts 15, 17, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy. Notice that. Instead of rejoicing that the Messiah had come and that God was doing amazing works, they were jealous because people were following somebody else. There's always these kind of people in the religious world. Don't be surprised when it shows up in church or when your heart is tempted in the context of worship because that is the context of one of the earliest instances of religious envy. In order to see it, we look back all the way back in Genesis chapter 4. In verse 3, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of fruit of the ground, and Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock 
in their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Bitter jealousy took hold, and as a result, it manifest in murder. He killed his brother over a worship service. Most people don't physically kill today, but we do verbally assassinate people. (laughs) It comes out. Perhaps you find yourself quick to criticize, or you struggle with that critical heart towards someone you can sense God is really using them. That's when it's time to examine your heart and say, is this bitter envy? Is this bitter jealousy? Well, this is not God's wisdom. Don't listen to it. Don't become skilled in it. The second thing we're told about demonic wisdom is that it's driven by selfish ambition. This word means someone who seeks only their own, their own interests, their own promotion. It's also used even in that day of electioneering or intrigue for office, political gains, selfish ambition. We've seen it in our own hearts. We've seen it in the relationships around us, and we've definitely seen it in the politics of our country and around the world. Selfish ambition. It's the picture of a nasty political campaign where the Candidates assassinate each other verbally, attack each other's character, cause factions and division in the community. The way I like to think about it is it's a self-crusade driven by the power for our desire for power and recognition. So we go on this crusade for ourselves and whoever gets in the way, we're going to slash them down. Causes a lot of destruction, especially in the church. That attitudes can be found when we're tempted to serve for our own benefit or advancement. When we're tempted to serve for our own image in the eyes of others. When we serve in ministry, it should be about what we can do for others, how God can use us, not how people can serve us. And so two possible responses when somebody's struggling with these two areas of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. It's getting kind of quiet in the room because I think all of us know and have experienced this at some level in our own hearts. There's two possible responses. We can humble ourselves and allow the word of God to confront us and and deal with that sin and, in a sense, take a spiritual shower, let him wash away that uncleanliness. Or there's the other response, which James points out here, and that is to boast or to be false to the truth. Well, what does that mean? Well, It means when you see the bitter jealousy and selfish ambition that we would boast about it as if to say, um, it's a good thing. And sometimes people do this when they're caught in sin, is the temptation to say it's good. Listen to guys talk in the locker room. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. Where things that are wrong are gloried in. And that's what this word boast means anyway. It's to triumph over, to glory over, to boast about oneself by downgrading another person. So demonic wisdom searches for a way to glory in their self instead of giving glory to God. The second thing here, to be false to the truth, is denying 
that you're jealous or ambitious in a sinful way. To say, that's not what I'm doing. I'm really trying to advance the kingdom of God here. When we know in our own hearts, it's about more than that. Far better to admit bitter envy and selfish ambition because it's then that we can experience the forgiveness and healing of God in that dark and nasty place of our hearts. In verse 15, it goes on and says, This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, so don't be deceived by it. But it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. This is where it gets heavy. He says it's earthly, which doesn't seem too bad. Unspiritual seems a little worse. And then he drops the D word. Demonic. Ouch. Which means it falls in line with Satan's character. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were confronted for this very thing, thinking demonically. Um, In John 8.44, Jesus didn't mince word with the prideful religious leaders. Check this out. He confronts them and says, You are of your father, the devil. Ouch. Ouch. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Demonic wisdom is often mistaken as true wisdom. It's deceptive. And that's why Satan is so crafty He tempted Christ in Matthew chapter 4 at the beginning of his ministry with with what seemed like a wise plan to advance the kingdom and bring about the rule of Christ. And, And Satan says, hey, throw yourself from the pinnacle of the temple and the angels will catch you. Everybody will see and they'll proclaim you as king and your kingdom will advance. Of course, Jesus said, don't tempt the Lord. And then he says, check out all the kingdoms of the world. And somehow in a moment, he showed him the kingdoms of the world. He says, I'll give you all this. You'll be ruling the way God meant you to rule on this earth. All you have to do is bow the knee and worship me. And Jesus answers with, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. At first, it looks so good, and it seems to be what God wants. And so demonic wisdom could come in. And it's deceptive, and it masquerades as true wisdom. But when we get into the Word and we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, He can point those things out, and He gives us that sense of discernment to say, you know what, something's not right about this. There's something that feels dirty about this. And so, in verse 16, it goes on, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, which we already talked about, there will be disorder in every vile practice. And so you see two things that are the fruit, if you will. If selfishness, um, selfish ambition and jealousy are allowed to continue in your lives, it will lead to the fruit of disorder and vileness. So check this out. Disorder means rebellion, riot, instability, and confusion. It was a common word for anarchy or political turmoil. The ESV study Bible says this, disorder connotes a chaotic frenzy of fighting in the church. Oh, man. There's an old story told of a man who left all of his possessions, including his farm and all the buildings on it, to the devil. Now, when he passed away, his will went to court, and the judge had to decide to do with the man's will because nobody could figure out what to do. How do you leave this to the devil? So 
the judge ruled this. The only way to carry out such a will is to order that this farm be left untouched by human hands throughout its history. So that's what they did. They left the farm and its buildings untouched. After a few years, brush and weeds began to grow up and the buildings began to fall apart and the farm was a scene of disorder and ugliness. That is this idea of disorder. Are there spiritual weeds growing in your life, relationships becoming dilapidated and falling apart? Paul teaches us that this is not a character trait or a fruit of, the, of God's wisdom. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33, in a God of confusion, but of peace. And if you know him, and he is alive and well in your life, you will notice that peace. Instead of disorder. But the last thing we're warned of, the fruit of demonic wisdom, is every vile practice. Compromise leads to compromise, leads to compromise. A slippery slope of sinful living. And so, when you see these things begin to grow in your life, perhaps it's been a different kind of wisdom you've been living by. And so James tells us, change your operating system. Stop using Windows. (laughs) Or Mac. (laughs) Use a heavenly operating system that doesn't have glitches. Wouldn't that be nice? So that's the last point in in verses 17 through 18, discovering heavenly wisdom. It says, but the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Heavenly wisdom is the opposite. It's much higher than demonic wisdom. And 1 Corinthians 1, 19 through 20, you know if you live according to this wisdom, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb. You're going to be the weird one. You're going to be like Moses, the, the meek one, and stand out. In 1 Corinthians 1, 19 through 20, it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And in 1 Corinthians 1.25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. How much more the wisdom of God. And so, as we choose to live according to the wisdom of God, we need to recognize that there is this tension between the two types of wisdom that is each is get, vying for your attention. A.W. Tozer reflects on this, and he says this, The two kinds of wisdom are in perpetual conflict. Indeed, when seen from the lofty peak of Sinai or Calvary, The whole history of the world is discovered to be but a contest between the wisdom of God and the cunning of Satan and falling men. And so which side will you choose to be on? Seven qualities that set you apart as one who is wise in the ways of heavenly wisdom. And the first is purity. He doesn't mean when... This word first is used, it it doesn't mean first numerically, but first in priority. So that means this is the quality that all the other ones flow from. It starts with purity. And that is a, a message that's really opposite of what we feel if somebody was to say to you, you're just a goody two shoes, you know? 
that makes us feel small. You know, nobody wants to be that person. But God's wisdom says, you know, it all starts with purity, which means innocent, without moral defect, de- defect or blemish, not half good and half bad, but free from any mixture of evil. Purity is one of the great attributes of God that you could come to him and trust that he doesn't have any weird motivations. He's not secretly in some other universe doing evil things. You can always trust him. He's faithful. He's true. He's pure. He's holy. And so the spirit of the age says, what can I get away with and still be a Christian? (laughs) That's not purity. If we begin thinking like, what can I get away with and still be called a Christian or still get to heaven? We're in a bad spot. The Spirit of God asks, how can I remain as pure as I can be? How can I pursue purity in my thought life? How can I set my eyes upon things that are right and good? How can I keep my motivations pure? The reason why I do things, to have them be without any evil intent or selfishness. Purity begins in our heart. Number one, it's something that we don't have in the first place. Jesus died on the cross and his blood was shed to make us pure. So the purity we have, we didn't even earn it. He gives it to us. But then as we choose to live in purity in the practical decisions of everyday life, the Holy Spirit is in the process of making you pure. And so not only do we have it positionally as God looks at us, but we allow the Spirit to produce purity in us. In Titus 1.15 it says to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their mind and consciences are defiled. You know, that's always kind of a good test. How am I doing with the issue of purity? Well, when people are talking and they say a word that in your mind has a connotation that's like bad or some sexual innuendo, you make up on your own because you heard a certain word. That's not pure. So to the pure, all things are pure. You know, no matter what you're hearing or seeing or or experiencing, um, you, you see it through a different light. And we choose to bring around us things that are pure. You know, the, the stuff that we read and how we use our computers and phones and and so on. And so even with religious activity, it's important that we choose to be pure. Because you could be fully into doing Christian things, but be in, in, in a way from doing a bunch of sinful things, but be impure. Ask the Pharisees. <laughs> they were messed up. And Jesus confronted them for it. And so we can remain pure by allowing the Spirit to have rule and reign in our hearts and minds. I've always loved this verse in Philippians 4.8 that I would consider as kind of a filter on your ears and your eyes as you exist on this earth because we're surrounded by impure things. They're coming at us from every direction. Philippians 4.8 tells us how to filter it. It says, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And when the other thoughts come into your mind, kick them out. Don't entertain them. And say, hey, come on in and and sit down and let's just talk for a little while. You know, that's the temptation. But rather, kick them out. Put in your heart and mind, purity. And so when we have that, everything else 
flows from it. When we don't have it, it corrupts. All the other qualities we're about to look at here somewhat quickly. The second one is peaceable. We can have peace in our hearts, and we can have peace on the outside, in a sense, in relationships with those around us. This peaceable means freedom from anxiety and inner turmoil and frustration. Are you experiencing peace in your life? The wisdom of God will lead to that. It'll lead to a peace with God, which is great. You know, it's interesting in the Proverbs, it says the righteous are as bold as a lion and the unrighteous flee, though no one pursues them. Why? Well, because the unrighteous, they're always feeling guilty. I'm going to get caught. I'm going to get caught. And so their guilty conscience is always at their heels. But the righteous can be bold and have peace with God. And when you have peace with God, it leads to peace with man. The third word here is gentle. Gracious, fair, considerate, used of God's kindness in the Old Testament. The idea of gentle here is the idea of God being the judge. And though he can bring down judgment on sinners... He chooses rather to be kind, though they don't deserve it. That's gentleness. Again, it's kind of like meekness. You know, you have this power, but it's under control. But gentleness is having the power to do something, to judge, to pay back, and choosing not to. So the world tells you to be assertive, stand up for your rights. You're first, or whatever it is. But instead of insisting on our own rights and holding people to the letter of the law, we exercise grace and leniency towards the people around us. We pass over irritations and offenses. I love this verse in 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. That's gentleness. We choose to love someone instead of nitpicking every little thing that they've done wrong. Not that sin shouldn't be confronted, but there is an aspect that, you know, you got to sometimes choose to look over an offense. You can't live that way all the time, always being offended at everybody. Well, the next one is open to reason. Is a willingness to listen, easily persuaded to be obedient, a willingness to yield one's interest for the interest of another. So the wisdom of God is, is not being stubborn, but teachable, open, flexible, open to change, easy to work with. Ecclesiastes 4.13 tells us this, better was a poor and wise youth than an old foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. How much better is it to be this poor young wise youth that says, I'm open to reason. I'm teachable, moldable, shapeable, flexible than a boss or a king or a ruler or a pastor or whatever, person of, in power that does not know how to take advice. The fifth one, full of mercy and good fruit. Mercy, I think the best way to describe this is to tell you a story. Of a godly woman that I knew that was one day walking in downtown Seattle in the winter, one evening after a Seahawks game, and with a group of friends, as they were walking down the street and um, past a homeless man sleeping under a bench covered in newspapers, uh, you know, the, and they were, were all Christians, by the way, they all kind of noticed the guy and kept walking. And, and as they got further down the sidewalk, closer to the ferry, they realized that this lady was missing. 
And they started to panic for a second. Oh, no. Where did she go? What happened to her? And then she came running up the sidewalk to meet up with them again, and she didn't have her coat on. And they were like, what, what happened to your coat? It's freezing out here. What are you doing? And she described that she went by that man and could not walk by without giving her, her coat to him. And she said, if it wasn't for the grace and mercy of God, that would be me under that bench. Mercy is to have compassion on somebody, but not just feel compassion. It's to do something, an action that is compassionate. Godly wisdom, heavenly wisdom is merciful and impartial, which means free from prejudice or distinctions, without ambiguity or uncertainty. James said earlier in his book, confronted people for being partial in the church because they were giving attention to this rich, attractive guy that had gold rings on his finger. They were like, hey, come and sit next to me in this nice seat we have saved for you. And then a, another person came in with tattered clothes that probably had an odor. <laughs> and they said, oh, well, why don't you come and sit by my feet? Oh, how kind of you. But James says that that, in James 2.4, have you not been made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? <laughs> uh, heavenly wisdom is impartial. Partiality has no place in the church among God's people. And then lastly, heavenly wisdom is sincere. Without pretending to be something you're not, genuine, real, true. With a wise man or woman, what you see is what you get. There's no secret life at home. There's no secret pocket of sin where nobody knows. What you see is what you get. There's no religious hypocrisy. But sincerity. And when you meet a sincere person, you can really feel and sense or see in their lives something that is powerful and true and real, and it makes an impact. They stand out to you. In verse 18, it ends with, And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So if you're living according to heavenly wisdom, there is a, there's fruit from that. We saw the fruit from demonic wisdom, which was disorder and every vile practice. But here, the fruit is righteousness and peace. In the 5th century, there was a monk named... Telemachus, who wanted to live a very godly life. So he moved out into the wilderness and lived alone, praying and fasting and meditating. And as he was out there seeking God and feeling holy, one day God spoke to him. He said, you're being selfish. <laughs> if you want to live for me, you need to serve others. You need to live with others, be part of their lives. And so he decided to return to the city. And out of all of the cities, he returned to Rome. At a time when Rome had just won this great victory over the Goths. Now at this time in the 400s, Rome was officially Christian. And so the triumph over the Goths brought people pouring into the church. But there was one pagan practice that persisted in their midst. Though Christians were no longer thrown to the lions in persecution, prisoners of war were actually cast into the arena to fight and kill each other. And so these Christians would gather the crowds would roar in bloodlust 
as the gladiators battled. So when Telemachus comes walking into Rome, it's the day of the games, the day of the gladi gladiator fight. So he's following the noise as he's coming in, thinking, what is this roar? And he makes his way to the arena where there's 80,000 people gathered to celebrate, if you want to call it that. And so the fights began, and Telemachus was totally floored. Men for whom Christ had died were about to kill each other to amuse a Christian audience. And so he jumped into the arena and stood between the two gladiators, pleading with them to stop. And the crowd was furious at their delay of entertainment. So after yelling and screaming and him not moving, they stoned him to death from the stands. The result was that the contest was canceled that day. People left when they had realized what they had done. Three days later, the Roman emperor declared Telemachus a martyr and put an end to the gladiator contest for the rest of their history. There was a historian that said this about Telemachus. His death was more useful to mankind than his life because he took a stand for righteousness and peace. But it wasn't easy, even in a Christian audience. And you may one day find yourself in that place where you have to live according to the wisdom of heaven. And the fruit of that decision will be righteousness and peace, but sometimes it comes at a cost. Self-sacrifice. Setting aside your own desires. Your reputation, whatever it may be. But whatever seeds you're sowing today will produce a crop. What will you reap? In Isaiah 32, 17, and the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quiet and trust forever. What a great harvest of a life lived for God. And so, as we close... Two ways you can live your life. Heavenly wisdom or demonic wisdom. And I know this was kind of a long passage, but or a long message, short passage, right? <laughs> but I want to end with this quote from a book that I'm going through with the staff um, that's really challenging all of us to rethink what we see leadership as and bringing it back to a biblical view. But it says this, in a culture drunk on power and in need of an inter is in need of an intervention, the church has too often become an enabler. In many places, churches openly affirm the way from below. Instead of being told how desperately I am in need of God, I am repeatedly told how much God needs me. Instead of being exhorted to pick up my cross and follow Christ, I am told that Jesus wants to be my partner in the plan I have to rid my life of the struggles, all struggles and challenges. We hear gospels of moralism centering on my power to become a better person, and we hear sermons offering up God as merely another resource along my journey for a successful and happy living. Sermons become pep talks, Amid a quest for power and significance, instead of worship being an invention to come before, or I'm sorry, instead of worship being an invitation to come before God in humble and awe and reverence, worship becomes an experience meant to lift us above the travails of everyday life and give us a sense of transcendence. Instead of hearing God's vision of redeeming all things but in Christ, by the power of his spirit, we hear of the pastor's vision to grow an even bigger church that does bigger things so that he can be powerful and we can be powerful with him. Those are convicting words coming from two young men that have come from or out of two of the biggest churches in our country today. And God is stirring 
in the hearts of the next generation a desire for heavenly wisdom because earthly wisdom has made its way into, sadly to say, the church, perhaps even our own life. So let that be these verses that we read today, a wake-up call, but also an opportunity to live a much more powerful life in Christ, a much more fruitful life as we stand before him one day and give an answer for all that we've said and done. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for giving us a vision of heavenly wisdom and for gifting us with this wisdom by your Spirit, if we so choose to receive it. As it said in James 1 at the beginning, that if we lack wisdom, all we need to do is ask. And that you give to us without finding fault. Lord, you will grant it to us according to your goodness and grace. And God, we just come before you and admit our tendency to be self-centered and selfish and jealous and all these different things. Lord, I pray that you would set those things aside that we might live according to your ways. Lord, protect this church. And we pray that you would bestow this church body with wisdom from above. And that we would see a great harvest of righteousness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.